Well, no doubt, like everyone else here, I can't remember a time when uh, Professor Hodder, you know, been here, hasn't been a, a leading world archaeologist. And surely watching the endless streams of creativity that emerge from his pen is one of the great joys of being in this kind of intellectual sphere, and we have a lot to be grateful for from him. But at the same time, of course, it, it didn't have to work out like that. And if I could just give a tiny anecdote, which I don't think has been published. Ian, of course, was able to restart at Chatter Hewitt, partly because of the wonderful stories that Jimmy Mallard made of Chatter Hewitt, stories which may or may not have justifications we sift through his work. But if you remember the wonderful exhibition that's just closed in the cell house, there's a, a timeline there, and it says that the original prehistoric survey of Anatolia was conducted by David French, Alan Hall, and Jimmy Mallard. And then somehow or other, the three become one. And I was looking at this, and it reminded me, well, how did three become one? How did Jimmy Mallard take it over? And then I suddenly remembered an anecdote told me by David French, who my um, uh, uh, to know quite well. And David told me once, about that survey, and he said that they were traveling together across Anatolia, and then there was, so they were just going in a jeep. And they were looking at various things and wondering what the next great project would be, even though, of course, Jimmy Mann had ordered that project, so so did David. Alan Moore was secretary of the Institute at the time. And they came up to, to Chattanooga, and then apparently Jimmy Mann instantly changed. He recognized immediately the importance of the mound, and he looked around and he clutched his stomach. He said, Oh, Montezuma's revenge has got me again. Oh, I'm terribly ill. Get me the collier. Get me the collier. They got him the collier <coughs> and he leapt on the bus straight back to Seaton Lloyd, who was director of the Institute at the time. He said, I found the most priceless discovery whilst David and Alan carried on with the survey. And thereby, you see, David was picked at the post by two or three weeks and history um, was written as it was. Otherwise, you see, we could have been talking about David French's chapter view, or about Alan Moore's chapter view. Well, I don't think of Alan Moore's as he was a classicist, but certainly David French, um, his vision of chapter view would have been completely different from Jimmy Mallard. So maybe he would have done somewhere else in that time. Um, there we are. So no, serendipity of history. Um, and I, can, I can tell that I know now because all the parties are dead. dead so. <laughs> <laughs> from my and you are the first to hear it. And indeed, as I said, only came to mind when I saw that wonderful exhibition about the creation of scholarly knowledge, which, which uh, 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 certainly is something that preoccupies us all. Well, there we are. There we are. That's enough, of course, mm. for me. It's once again just to welcome you all and to say to him, I hope I've got the right PowerPoint up. If you've got any PowerPoints up, <laughs> then I look forward very much to your lecture. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So thank you very much, David. I'd like to talk to you about that um, afterwards and uh, get more, hear more about it. So I, I um, am not going to be talking very much about the curious case of Chattahoo ex exhibit, which I thought was really wonderful, and uh, I don't know how many of you saw it, but, but it was mainly talking about the methods that we've been using at uh, Chattahoo. Um, and uh, I want instead today to talk about the results of the work that we've been doing uh, there. Um, we've just recently finished the excavations at Chattahoo uh, that I've been conducting for 25 years. And there's now a new team that's uh, led by uh, a Turkish uh, archaeologist um, from Ege University, uh, and she will continue on. But um, I, I just want to try and summarize what we're doing. And we're at the moment in the process of, of um, uh, doing all the analysis of the data and putting that together. And that's the, the main aim of uh, the current team's uh, work. So, um, I just point it directly at the machine. And it's this one here, isn't it? I'm not getting any of the so it works if you point it directly at it. Is it actually on? Mm -hmm. Oh, 
itself um, is uh, in, in Konya, uh, to the southeast of uh, Konya itself, uh, and uh, consists of two mounds. This is the main famous man that, that uh, Jimmy uh, started working on in the 60s. Uh, and this is the, the western man, which is a slightly later, later <coughs> date. And we've been working mainly in two areas, this northern area and this southern area. And in the northern area, uh, the focus has been on trying to understand the uh, uh, overall arrangement of buildings at one moment in time. So this is looking at uh, the, the buildings as they were being excavated uh, recently. Uh, and in the southern area, the focus has been on continuing uh, Jimmy Mallard's excavations down to the uh, lower levels. So here we're trying to look at the overall sequence of occupation of the site uh, through about 21 meters of uh, occupation. So, so our, 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 the work um, over the 25 years has changed a lot. In, in, in the beginning, we were working with a very small uh, team uh, that gradually expanded to there were about 160 people working uh, at the site in various forms of specialism. Uh, and uh, as well as the team changing, the methods changed very radically over time. We started off doing everything by recording on uh, bits of paper <coughs> and ended up in, in, with an entirely uh, digital uh, process uh, using uh, tablets in the field to do all the recording and producing these 3D images and putting layers back inside them and, and also reconstructing uh, uh, Chapel Huyuk in virtual contexts. Uh, but allowing people to interact with these 3D models in a, in, in, so that they could look into the database. And, and some, if, if you did go and see the Curious Case exhibit, um, there the were goggles that you could use to, to get a sense of what the, the site was like and you could pick up objects and so on. So the methods changed a lot through time. But I'm going to just talk about five things uh, uh, that um, have, have changed a lot in terms of our understanding of the site over over the period of time that I've been working there, looking at the landscape and the environment, looking at population estimates, looking at um, the question of whether there is a real ranking or hierarchy at Chantahuyu, and then looking at other aspects of social organization, and then looking very briefly then at the end uh, at temporal change, how, how the site changed um, from about 7,000 BC uh, to about 6,000 BC. So starting off with landscape and the environment, this is a really interesting example of how um, ideas change as, as research continues because the initial work that was done by Neil Roberts and a, and a large group of paleoenvironmentalists uh, argued that this sort of clustered settlement pattern of, of, of houses were, was on a, on a mound in the middle of a, a rural wetland. It was a, um, seasonally flooded but throughout the year very, very wet. and. Uh, and th this raised very interesting questions about why Chattahuyu was where it was, or why Chattahuyu was there at all, um, because it seemed like not a great environment with a lot of people in the middle of a, of a wetland. Uh, and uh, it was particularly striking that surveys of the Konya Plain and of areas around the Konya Plain, the sort of hill, hill, hill lands around the plain, uh, all showed that the region was just abandoned 
during Chapel Hill. So that ev either everybody moved into Chapel Hill, which seems like the most likely, or people dispersed somewhere. So Chapel Hill was really on its own in a quite, quite a vast uh, landscape. So why was this particular, apparently not great <coughs> location chosen? This work was done very largely on a sampling through some cores in the area around Chapel Hill to look at the sediments of alluvium that built up around the site. Um, and more recent work by uh, Ayala and Wainwright uh, has just done a lot more coring. And as they've done more <coughs> coring, uh, they realized that in fact, the, the landscape was much more varied and diverse and changed and with lots of undulations and, and river channels and so on. And in fact, it was much more like these sorts of things, like a delta uh, of slow moving water going through lots of little rivulets and, and channels. So that going through time before the site, you had a river system that developed and became this very dendritic pattern. And that's when Chapel Huyu uh, formed. And then through time, that dendritic pattern has continued and both the East Mand and the West Mand were, were constructed. So we now have a very different uh, idea of the environment and this is important because with the older idea of this wetland, this pure wetland, it became very difficult to see where the fields were, where the crops were. Um, and it was actually argued in a series of publications that the fields must have been about uh, 12 kilometers away, which seemed a dark thing to do, to, you know, to put this site and have a field so far away. And so this new, this new model allows us to think that the fields and so on were, were placed on rises, rises in, in, in the alluvium and marl uh, in, in the area around the site, so that the fields could all have been much closer to Chatham Hook itself. So that's the model that we now have, that this was a very rich environment because it was wet, but it was not so wet uh, that, that you couldn't have uh, crops grown and sheep grazing. Uh, and it was a very diverse mosaic of different sorts of environment which allowed the people who were there to have access to lots of different resources including the clay that was very important in constructing Chantahuyuk itself. The, the next thing that I want to talk about is, you know, I've, I've given the impression that there were a lot of people at Chantahuyuk and so this idea that um, Chantahuyuk had a lot of people uh, has uh, been very testing to, to much archaeological theory and so many people have argued that um, we, we must have got it wrong in terms of the population estimate. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the recent work which, which tries to evaluate the population uh, more carefully. The, the early uh, work on this was done by someone called Craig Sesford who tried to look at a whole range of different techniques and uh, uh, to estimate population, he came up with a number of about 3,500 to 8,000 people, which for the Neolithic is a very, very large number of people. I mean, on the whole, we've tended to see Neolithic societies as much smaller than that. And so many people have rejected this idea. It was based on a whole range of different types of uh, ideas about how, how you estimate population, for example, uh, archaeologists have notions that you have a certain number of, you often have a certain number of people per square uh, meter <coughs> in, in certain, in, in particular types of settlement, or we have some notion that there were X number of people living in a house and we can estimate the numbers of houses on the site and so on and so forth, or you can do it in terms of volume. There's lots of ways of trying to estimate population, all of it wonky, but they're all doable. And uh, so Sesford would use a whole range of techniques to come up with this rather broad range from 3,500 to 8,000. But as I said, many people don't like that. And so, for example, in a, a recent uh, paper, uh, these people have said this is, a, this is a gross overestimation. And they argue that because of what's called scalar stress, which basically means that if you've got a whole lot of people together, uh, it's very difficult to see how they would organize themselves unless there is some sort of central hierarchy. At Chapel Hui, as I'll show later, it's very, it's very unclear whether there was any central hierarchy. And on the whole, most people would say it was an egalitarian society, and not a centralized society. So how is it possible for an egalitarian society to organize themselves when there's such, when there's such a lot of people? There? Why isn't there a lot of violence and sort of crisis and so on? So these people argue that we must have got the numbers in hopeless, hopelessly wrong and the numbers must have been much more near a thousand or less. 
So it seemed to be important to try and use the plans that we have of the settlements of Chattanooga in order to estimate the population size. And, and in one way, it's all fairly straightforward. You could say, okay, well, this is a plan of buildings at Chattanooga. Uh, let's, let's guess how many people might have lived in these houses uh, and then sort of multiply that over the whole area of the site. But the trouble with that is that um, where, when you look in detail, you, you find that these different buildings are not all actually of the same date. And, and, it, and, and, and so it becomes very difficult to know how much of the site was open area at any one moment in time. And there are other sites in the, in the Anatolia and the Middle East of the site about the same time or slightly later where you can see how the population is moving around a lot on the site. It's not actually ever all of it inhabited. So the question is, were all these buildings actually um, lived in at the same time? In order to really get a, an understanding of the overall pattern of buildings, uh, we did a lot of geophysical uh, work, um, particularly uh, various types of um, radar uh, analysis, you know, in order to try to see what the overall pattern was. And this is very difficult because on a mound, uh, as I said, Channel League is about 21 meters high, there's a lot of, of wash off the top of the, an erosion off the top of the mound, which leads to a buildup of soil around the skirts. And it's very difficult to see through these very deep layers um, of, uh, of, of wash. But insofar as one could, using ground penetrating radar mainly, uh, what, what one found was that in, this is in the north area of the site, we've been excavating here, and I showed you just now the plan of the buildings there. We could also look outside that area and see that basically what you've got, you, it's difficult to see, but you get all of these houses on the same orientation as the houses in here, the sort of north, south, east, west walls, suggesting that as far as one can see, the, the overall distribution of houses continues right across uh, we can't see out here on the skirt, uh, but uh, where you can see, you have this continuous, um, apparently continuous use of space. But again, the problem is how much of this is really contemporary. So one, one thing to do is to sort of imagine Chattanooga as small as you can. And so what I've done here is look at the East Mound and, uh, and, and, and just take off. Uh, uh, all the skirt. We, we, um, the new the new team is actually excavating now in this little mound here, and that is very late. And so we let's remove that as a, a late bit, and let's assume that this skirt actually had no occupation. So let's just look at this area, which is the area where we have lots of evidence from various types of scraping uh, of the surface of the mound that there was actually occupation there. And then let's also look in very detail at the, um, the buildings themselves and see whether we can work out what is contemporary or not. And so this is work that Justin Isabi has been doing. And uh, each of these buildings has been very thoroughly uh, dated, as has these areas here, which are uh, open or midden areas at this particular moment in time. So this, this, is, the, this is the first part of the 65th uh, century BC and we've got very good dating here as a result of uh, work by Alex Bayliss on uh, the, the, the chronology of the site and using Bayesian statistics and so on has allowed us to see that actually all these buildings and these open spaces or midden areas or courtyards as now I call them uh, were actually all contemporary so we're sure that all these buildings and these open spaces are occupied at one moment in time and as you go from one building and then another building is built on top of it and so on, there's no gaps through time. So this allows us then to work out what proportion, at least in this area of the site where we can do this careful dating, what proportion of, of the, of the um, site uh, is an open area and what proportion includes actual uh, buildings. And you, sorry, you can't see this, but um, this allows us to, to work out what is the percent of open space, uh, so uh, not used by buildings, 26%. That allows you to work out the number of houses per square meter. And if you assume that four people lived in the house, then you get about eight people per 100 square meters. 
If we reduce the total area of the site in the way that I've just shown, you get uh, 7.2 hectares, uh, and that leaves the total population at the maximum, because Chakawiyo um, started small, grew bigger, and then declined. The total population at the maximum, uh, we end up with this at 5760, so still quite a high figure, although not as high as as uh, Cespit had originally got, three five hundred to 8,000. So there, there are still a lot of uncertainties in here. We could have more people per house or less people per house and so on. But, and, and it's still the case that we don't really know what was going on in the skirts. And it's possible that different parts of the site have different percentages of open space. But nevertheless, it seems to me that it's quite a good uh, estimate of around 5,000 to 6,000 people, which is still a very large number for these very sort of small-scale societies. <clears throat> so I want to move on from that to, to, to the obvious problem that I've already mentioned, that if you have a lot of people living together very densely, <laughs> tightly packed together, over a long period of time, you would expect there to be lots of violence, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly if you don't have a strong uh, central administrative hierarchy. You would expect there to be lots of violence. But one of the things that is distinctive at Chadwick is that we don't find any evidence uh, of people being buried, because people were buried beneath the floors of the houses. We don't find a lot of evidence in those, of those uh, skeletons with evidence violence on them that led to their death. So for example, we don't find arrowheads stuck in the spine or in the body. Uh, we don't find parry fractures on the arm. Uh, we, we don't find spearheads stuck through them or whatever. I mean, that, that's quite a common find in archaeological sites. We don't find anything like that. So for a long time, we argued that really there was no violence at Chateau Hill. Somehow it was a very peaceful society. More recently, the Human Remains team has been doing work uh, on the skull, and, uh, and we have about 800 uh, um, uh, individuals now found in Chatelhuyu. So they have a large data set, but a few of them have evidence of what they call blunt force trauma, this sort of, which is evidence of some sort of uh, bashing on the head, but that doesn't lead to death. And in particular, you, you see uh, it concentrated in this part of the skull. There's no difference between men and women or whatever, but it does seem to be the case that um, there was some sort of violence, but it was <coughs> that sort of violence that led to death. So it's a sort of controlled violence. So again, we have this question of how was, how was violence controlled? How was it managed? So I want to talk about whether the work was in fact some sort of centralization, some sort of uh, idea of a, of a ranking or hierarchy and try and understand that a little bit. And what was the hierarchy like in Chatham And the way that we've come to talk about this in, is in terms of this notion of uh, history houses, which I'll, which I'll explain to you. So the houses at Chatham Hoyuk are all built of mud brick, and they're fairly uh, small, uh, and uh, they were lived in for maybe 80 to 120 years, that sort of time span. When the house um, was abandoned, the upper parts of the walls were knocked down and the, and the house was filled in to create a platform on which another house was built. And that went on through time, and we sometimes have sequences of eight houses being built on top of each other. And the reason they were built on top of each other is that these walls could, were supported by the stumps of the previous building, so it created a more stable, stable house. So what we found is that there are some houses that get rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt in the same place, and we're calling these history houses, and then there are other houses which are built in one place and then abandoned and it becomes mid and or open area and then things change through time. So, you, so it's, there's a lot, there are some houses which really continue and there are some houses that uh, don't. And one of the uh, relationships that I used to think that we had was a strong relationship between, between the, these history houses which had long continuity and uh, the number of burials uh, in them. And, and you can see here a sort of correlation between the number of levels of construction and the number of burials in, in the houses. 
and so it looks like a good correlation and I published that but in more recent work I am now worried about this I think it's very difficult to know a chapel who um, in many cases uh, how, how many levels of how many times a house was rebuilt because we only have very limited keyholes in the chapel here but what we do uh, have very clearly is a, a relationship in, in our new data between uh, the elaboration of a building and the, and the number of burials in a building. So the elaboration index uh, is an indication of how many bulls horns there are placed in the building, uh, how much symbolism there is uh, in a building, how many paintings are on the walls, uh, how many um, posts and, and, and uh, how many platforms. So a whole range of indices of how elaborate architecturally a particular house was and the, the, the more elaborate houses the more elaborate houses here tend to have more burials so you can have up to 60 people buried in a house so you can you have a sort of relationship here which is very affected by this outlier but nevertheless that we ended up with we end up with a fairly strong relationship even in buildings that we've not fully excavated you have again a fairly fairly good uh, relationship between the elaboration index and the total number of people buried in there. And so the argument is that these more elaborate buildings with more burials, that they're somehow distinguishable and that they are concerned very much with the construction of memory and the creation of continuity through time. Um, what's also interesting, however, is that if you look at the amount of storage space there are in these buildings, you don't find any relationship between the amount of storage uh, st space and uh, the, the, the elaboration of the building. So this is, this is suggesting that there are some buildings that are more elaborate, have more symbolism, and they have more burials, but these more elaborate buildings do not control uh, stories. They don't, they don't have more stories. They don't have more evidence of production also. There's no, nothing to suggest that they're controlling the economy in the way that you might expect, expect if you have a normal sort of hierarchy. So as I said, we, there are some, some houses that are very elaborate in terms of symbolism. Th this sort of house. Bulls, heads, paintings on the walls and, and so on. And they tend to have lots and lots of burials. But these houses don't seem to also control the economy. They're not, it's not that we find more evidence of groundstone production or lithic production or pottery production or agricultural production. It's not the case that they have more evidence of storage, that they're controlling the resources better than other buildings. And the same is true if we look at uh, the um, for example, the number of figurines in houses. Here what we've done is we've, we've put all the houses from the least elaborate, we've ranked them to the most elaborate, and then we've looked at the number of figurines in each house, and you see there's just no correlation. And we find this over and over again, it's really boring each other, you can do all these analyses, desperate to find whether there's more of a particular type of something in these more elaborate houses, and we just never find anything. It's always that, that, it, that there is just nothing else that correlates. Another example of a lack of, complete lack of correlation is you would have thought that the richer or the more elaborate buildings with the more burials, you'd have thought they'd have richer burials, mm. but they don't. The, 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 there's no relationship of the richness of the burials with the elaboration of the building. Yes. Would you like to ask as you talk? Is that all right? Or should we ask later? Perhaps, perhaps later. Maybe. You can remember your question. Have you got some time for questions? Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of that question of um, how is Chanwe organized, we, we can conceive of a society in which um, there are particular houses that hold, that hold people that have a, a ritual status, both in terms of symbolic elaboration and in terms of burial, that they somehow control all that. And it does seem that people were buried preferentially into those houses. So you didn't, you weren't necessarily buried in the house in which you lived in. You would be buried into these larger, more elaborate 
So not larger, these more elaborate houses with more variants. And so th there were these houses which are central in terms of the ancestors and central in terms of symbolism and control of ritual, but they were not, there was no other evidence that they had other sorts of power or control. <coughs> so where does that leave us? Does, could one say that these ritual leaders in these ritual houses, that they somehow managed to control society? Well, maybe they did through a very complex belief system, but it's a strange notion, because how would they do that without the control of force or without, or without um, control of the economy? How would they sustain that thing, that sort of system over, over the long term? So I, I still call Chateauhyuk an, egal an aggressively egalitarian society in the sense that, that it tries to prevent real economic differences emerging. But, isn't, but, it, but, but there, clearly are, there clearly are differences of other sorts that are found, that are found there. And it may be that one has to imagine some sort of uh, group of um, elders, ritual leaders, who in some, in a, in some sort of collective way managed uh, Chateauhyuk. But so how then was the rest of the society organized? How, how, whatever the answer to what I've just been saying is, how was society itself organized? And there's been an enormous number of people who tried to make sense of Chateauhyuk, often using Jimmy Millard's uh, data. Uh, and this is an example that was published recently by Ian Kite. Um, and what he's doing is making two points, really. What one is, he's arguing that on the basis of Mellart's data, there are some houses that are mainly used uh, for symbolic elaboration, <coughs> and there are other houses which are uh, important for burial. So he's, suge he's suggesting that uh, burial and house, burial and symbolic elaboration functions were separate at Chateauhyuk. Uh, and I've just shown you graphs which show that's not true, but nevertheless, um, he, he, he makes an argument on the basis of Mellart's data. He also argues that these different functions, these burial and, and ritual elaboration houses, are, are, are different functions within a group of houses, which he gets the idea of a room block uh, from the American Southwest, where you have, the, you have Pueblo societies, which in some way look like Chateauhyuk. And, um, in my view, this is complete nonsense because there is absolutely no archaeological evidence that you have these walls laid out uh, and then you have houses built inside them. There are, just, there are just no walls like this. So in my view, this is just um, fantasy. So, but nevertheless, what he's suggesting is that you have these local groups in some way and that society was sort of grouped in this in, in this sort of way into neighborhoods or, or clusters of some sort. And um, that, that's an idea that many people have suggested in various ways. And so one of my students, uh, Camilla Matsukato, uh, has been uh, doing a, a network analysis, or a type of network analysis, where she's taken every house, and the houses are shown here by these circles. She's taken every house and looked at uh, what's found in the house. And so she's looking both at the architectural elaboration of the house and whether it has bull's horns and paintings and platforms and so on, how many they are, but also where the platforms are in the house and where <coughs> the burials are and how many burials they have and what type of artifacts are found with the burials. But she's also <laughs> looking at um, uh, the, the botanical remains from each house and the faunal remains from each house and the lithics from each house and the pottery from each house. And then she is using the, all that information in order to link together houses that are most similar in terms of all their material culture, both the architecture and all the artifacts in them. So she's linking those houses together, which are most similar in, in, in that sort of sense. And so if you've got two, uh, two houses here which are close together, that's because they're very similar in material culture. It's not it's nothing to do with where they are spatially. It's just because they're very similar in terms of material culture. And she can tell what, what's causing the similarity by looking at these things, which are the different types of artifact that she has used in order to create the, the linkage between the house. And what's very remarkable when you do this is that, um, you know, sorry, you can't see this. I, I can see, and also I know the numbers. 
this house here is number one, and this is number three, this is number 77, this is 131. But when I look at all these numbers of these houses, these are numbers that we gave to the house to identify them. These are all uh, in the um, north area of the site. And if you look at these numbers here, these are all in the south area of the site. So remember that there's no data that's put in here about spatial patterning. But what it's producing is two clusters of buildings which are in the south and the north of the site. So that's immediately suggesting that there are communities of people who are somehow differentiating themselves from each other, the north and the south uh, areas. And we, we can look at this in more detail by look, looking specifically at the houses and where they are. This is the north area and this is the south area. And again, if you look at these, you, you find that this is uh, 79, uh, 80, 89, and 76. Th that is these four houses. So again, nothing, nothing spatial was put in here, but there's a cluster of houses here that come up similarly in a similar position in this network diagram, <coughs> suggesting that not only is there a big difference between the north and the south in terms of two communities, but also that even within the south, there is little groups groups of houses that are distinctive. So that suggests that there is something very neighborly about Chattahoo, that people who are living together are, are somehow very close to get each other in, in, in various ways, in terms of their material culture, which suggests that, that uh, who you live by and where you live is, is very important in creating neighborhoods that organize themselves, perhaps, within the overall structure of Chattahoo. However, there are also buildings that just don't fit into this pattern. So for example, all of these buildings here are in the north. All of these ones are in the north. But suddenly here, there's building 97, which is here in the south. So this sh building should be over there, but it's not. And similarly, this building 102 over here uh, just doesn't fit. It should be over here. It's very like the ones in the south. So as well as there being these little clusters and groupings of houses, uh, based on neighborhoodness, there are also cross-cutting connections across the site as a whole. And I want to just explore that a little bit more by looking at uh, one of the houses at Chattelhook in more, more detail. Uh, this is uh, Building 80, uh, which is in the southern area of the, the site, and the, the western wall has been eroded off, so we don't have that here. But this is the northern wall, the eastern wall and the southern wall. This is a small side room. And uh, this is a very typical Chattelhue layout with the oven uh, and the entrance in the southeast corner. And then you move forward and move northwards in the house to where you have benches and platforms under which people are buried. We'll come back to this house uh, later. But there are burials under this platform. You can just see that on the wall here above it, there's a painting. And uh, it, it's a sort of geometric painting, but many layers of painting uh, on the same wall. And if we look at the design, you, you can see that it has these vertical verticals, and then there are triangles attached to the verticals. And then between the triangle, some of the verticals are missing, as you can see here. Uh, and then you have this brick pattern that zigzags between the triangles. So if you try and remember that, um, this is it here, and that's the building there. But over here, there's another building which has a remarkably similar design. So you have these verticals and these triangles, and then the brick pattern between them. So it seems very unlikely that these two buildings didn't know about each other and hadn't seen each other. So there's some sort of connection between them. But they're not next door to each other. There's one here and one over there. And if we try and look at a whole range of other traits, we, we see the same thing. Uh, so it's a very messy diagram, but, it, but it's intended to be messy. Because the idea is to show that there are connections between buildings. For example, some buildings have leopard reliefs but they're not by each other, they're spread out all over the site. Uh, there are some buildings with these splayed figures that Nellar thought were bears. Again, they're not found in neighboring uh, houses, they're found all over the site, um, so, and so on and so forth. And so you get this very complex set of relationships 
creating a network that, that is, goes beyond the, the local neighborhood. I've already said that there are some buildings with lots of burials. The size of these circles indicates the number of burials here. And I've said that these, bur these people were buried in from other places. We don't actually know where they were buried in from. And so th these may, this might be a, a thing that's done locally, or it might be a thing that's done on a larger scale. But all this is telling us is that there are very complex networks of relationships at the local and uh, whole site level. And the, the burial data is important in adding to this idea of connections across between houses uh, at a larger scale. And so uh, many people at Chattahuyuk are buried beneath the floors um, and are left in a very simple way, just buried beneath the floors. But then you get many people added in, people open up these platforms and bury more people and cover them over and then bury more people through time as they're living in the house. We know very obviously of a certain type of um, recirculation of human bones, which is the removal of skulls. So we find skeletons with their skulls missing, uh, but we find skulls deposited in other burials. So this is a woman uh, who's been buried with the skull of another woman, uh, and that skull has been plastered and painted. Uh, and she's very sort of touching in a way. Her, the foreheads are, are touching and they're sort of looking at each other in the, in the grave. So we have quite a lot of evidence that human skulls were circulated around in society. Because this skull, must, we think, was circulated for quite a long time because it has many layers of plaster on. So we think skulls were passed around in society and kept uh, before they were ultimately buried. So this is an example, again, of connections being made across the community. There's lots of evidence of secondary burial. We've been able to link up some burials uh, from one uh, burial to another burial, uh, teeth being removed even from one burial into another burial and so on, making connections of that sort. But recent work has been very interesting with regard to this. It used to be thought um, by my team that people were largely buried with their, when they were still fully fleshed, that when you died you'd be very tightly flexed and then uh, strings, ropes would have been put around you. And so you were, you were very tightly put, pull, pulled together and then placed in the grave and then covered over and so on. But for all series of reasons, we now realize that that's wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of um, the main evidence now is the sort of histological analysis of the bone, which shows that these bodies have been left out for quite a long time before they were buried. So they were dried or in some way treated so that the flesh largely didn't go entirely, but, but um, was very depleted on the body. Probably still have skin and some flesh on the body, but, but very much um, uh, uh, the result of some, something like desiccation. Uh, and, then, and then these bodies were then uh, placed in the grave, and that allowed very, very tight flexion uh, to occur. Uh, there's, but a lot of playing around with different parts of bodies example here, the, the torso with the legs and the arms missing and so on. So lots of ways in which different parts of the body were separated out and circulated. It's very difficult to know what scale that's happening, but it's clearly a very important way in which people in this community were connected. To make the argument yet more complex, um, the uh, work that's been done uh, on, the, on the paleogenetics, the genetics of the people who are buried in um, uh, Chattelhuyuk has not been possible to be based uh, at least so far on ancient DNA because we've got very poor preservation of ancient DNA. Although there is a new ERC project that is starting again to, to try and get better, better ancient DNA information out of the burials at Chattelhuyuk. So the human remains team has been using teeth as a proxy, uh, looking at the very, lots of very detailed measurements of teeth in order to try and work out genetic affiliation or genetic relationships between the people buried beneath the houses at Chapahuyu. And what you would expect is that uh, in any particular house that, that there would be closer genetic 
links to the people buried in the house than there are to other building, to other houses. You'd expect there to be some sort of nuclear family or some sort of sense of uh, a biological closeness between the individuals buried in a house. But in fact, when you look at the biological similarity based on teeth, you find that the, the, the burials, the individuals that are most closely together, are very rarely from the same house. So, so in fact, it seems that the people who are buried in the house were not a nuclear family in our sense at all, that the nuclear family was actually spread out uh, over the, the village. And for various reasons, we think this is happening uh, soon uh, after birth, when, people, when ch children are relatively young, they are fostered out or adopted out or whatever to other houses in the community. So, so that uh, as you grow up, you have your, um, the parents of the, who are the people in the house that you're living with, but you also have your biological uh, parents somewhere else. So again, what this is doing <coughs> is creating enormously complex linkages between everybody. So in a way, Maybe you don't even know who's related to who in the community yet. It's just a sort of mixing. The whole community is one family of people all uh, mixed together in a very sort of complex way that doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but it is very, very fascinating. So what, what I try to, to show is that, um, that at Chateau Huyo, you have uh, a lot of people held together by a very sort of complex set of ritual beliefs very much, many of which centre around the ancestors and the dead. And that there is a strong sense of neighbourhoodness and of community, but there are also cross-cutting ties that link people right across the whole community in, in various sorts of ways. And one, one has to imagine things like medicine societies or hunting societies, or also, I mean, lots of different ways in which uh, groups of this sort create co um, links over quite expansive um, communities. Just uh, another aspect of um, how society was organized is that, as I said before, we don't find uh, clear evidence of um, ranking in burials that correlates with anything. Uh, but we, what we do find is uh, differences in terms of age. And so it does seem to, to be the case that you have different diets for uh, young and old people. So and this, this is a plot of... Um, uh, isotopes indicating diet of individuals from Chatahuyu and um, the younger people uh, uh, over here on the left side of the graph and the older people are over here on the right. So suggesting that there's an age difference uh, and, th and this um, is quite a common characteristic of uh, societies of this uh, type. And uh, recent work on the, the figurines at Chatelhuyu has argued that um, these, cha these figurines are not really showing um, young uh, people, but they're tending to be shown, showing people who've got uh, big breasts, big bellies, and big bottoms, so the three Bs, uh, and that, that they're on the whole, it, these are people of, um, who, who've perhaps been through childbearing uh, and reached a certain age and, and status. And so that what is being, what is being um, uh, symbolized and celebrated here is, is, old, is older people, older women. And, uh, and another very important aspect of the archaeological evidence is that we find very little differences between the lifestyles of men and women. Uh, <coughs> both, both do very similar tasks and they have very similar diets. We can't see any differences, uh, almost no differences at all between the, the lifestyles, activities of men and women. So it just seems to be that old, the older you are, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, gives you a certain position and, and status. So I've been talking uh, mostly during this talk about uh, what is often called classic Chathuyuk, which is uh, the period around 6,500 and a bit before it. Um, but it's important to recognize, and I just want to say this quickly uh, at the end, that there are these uh, clear evidences of quite radical change through the sequence of Chantahuyu, which we've organized now uh, into an early, middle, late, and final. And the early starts around 7,100 BC, and the whole, the East Man finishes around 5,900 BC. And I, I, I don't want to go into this in any uh, great detail. Uh, what I've mainly been talking about is this middle phase, 
uh, which is the, the point of maximum occupation, the greatest density of people, the greatest density of burial, the greatest density of symbolic elaboration, and before and afterwards it's, it's, it's much less. Um, I, I think I'm just going to miss out these, um, these slides here. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, just make, draw attention to this one slide, which looks at uh, specialized production. So I, I said earlier that we could find no relationships between the uh, elaboration and number of burials in building and economic evidence. And that's true for that period that I've been talking about. <laughs> But towards the end of the occupation of Chattahuyu, uh, things really start changing in a very major way. And I can, if you want to ask questions about it, I can talk about them. But there's lots and lots of changes in the upper levels. And one of the most distinctive changes is that houses become much more independent. They're often not relying on other houses around them. They're more separate from each other. They have their own yards, uh, their own activity areas around the houses. And in particular, they start to have start to specialize in production. So this is a particular building that was excavated by Mellart. And you can see it's an, an example of this. So this is what used to be the house. But here we've got some other strange space added on, and there's an entrance. You know, earlier on in Chapel, you, there are no entrances at the ground level. You, everything is you come into the houses from through the roof. So here there's an actual entrance at ground level into a yard where there's lots of activities going on. So this is a very different, much larger sort of farm-like uh, structure, and in this particular building, we've we've re-excavated part of it and found huge numbers of um, uh, 3,100 lots of debitage pieces from from uh, working ground stone, from making ground stone querns and all sorts of things like that. So, so th th this is th th these big houses with uh, lots lots of elaboration, lots of evidence of storage and production here lots of evidence of, of making ground stone. The, these sort of large buildings, they remain very elaborate in various ways, but they seem to start being able to control uh, economic things. And this is more clearly a sort of hierarchical type of situation that emerges towards the end of Chattahuyu. Still not a massive hierarchy, but some sort of clear evidence of a link between the symbolic elaboration and economic uh, control. So thank you very much. I hope that gives you some sense of I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. But could I just ask you, after these 25 years, how now do you view your vision and Menard's vision? Do you see any overlap at all? Or how uh, um, do you articulate that difference? So, um, so Jimmy Mellard got quite a lot of things right. I mean, much, much of the basic um, idea of the, of the site the stratigraphy and, and um, the sequence and the organization of, of the architecture and so on. A, a lot of that he got sort of more or less right. And so um, it's important to recognize, recognize that. <coughs> and it's not surprising he didn't get a lot of things wrong because, I mean, in those days, uh, he, he was working in a, in a tradition that um, was relatively unscientific, if you like. And, uh, so there, was, there wasn't, wasn't a lot of detailed recording. In fact, there were, there were, as you know, there are no, no, real, no real records of, of the excavation, right. which he claimed because he, they got burnt in the fire. Um, but um, when we look in detail, for example, if you look at his plans and then we go and re-excavate and, and make our own plans, his, his plans are often two or three meters out and so on. But I mean, you know, if given the techniques he was using, maybe that doesn't matter so much. The, the, main, the main problem with, with Jimmy's work is that, as many of you probably know, he got mired in a series of controversies which have continued today until recently. New controversies can be, can continue to emerge. And so it becomes very difficult to know what he made up and what he didn't make up. And uh, that's a real problem for, for example, my students studying the art because you don't really know whether, how do you know whether you believe this, you know. And so, sometimes there are photographs, 
And so that's good. But on the other hand, we also find photographs that show pots of paint where he clearly, you know, touched them up. So how much, how much touching was going on? <laughs> so, I mean, he, he was a wonderful man in many ways, but he was also a charlatan. And, uh, and it's very, very, uh, and I was very good, close with him, and I, and I think, it, and I was very grateful to him for what he did. But, you know, th this, it's, there's been so much in the press recently about other controversies that he's been involved in, and other things that he made up, including whole languages and things, you know, that, that, that it's very, very difficult. And so, uh, I, I get very angry at people like Ian Kite, for example, who tries to use data from Mellon's time in order to make statements about Chapel Hill, because, you know, so it's very, yeah. But there are, but clearly the conclusions are not that dissimilar. I mean, a history house is not all that dissimilar from, you know, a priestly house, which is what he thought. He thought the were differences between priest houses and domestic houses. So he was sort of right, you know. Yeah. Because of course it's Jimmy Miller's version that got taken into the Turkish National Republic project. Yeah, well, well yeah, and, and the, the issue you raised about what would have happened if David French had excavated the site is absolutely fascinating. Because Chapel Hill is actually not a terribly wonderful site. It was made wonderful by Jimmy's drawings. You know, most, most of the famous I images of um, shrines with bull's horns and all sorts of things, he, he that was very, very much an imaginative reconstruction. Yeah. But it's those things that made Chattel really, really important and really hit the Illustrated London News and so on and so forth. So David French was a much more systematic, um, careful, modern scientist. And uh, uh, he would have done very little of Chattel very carefully. And he, you know, it, it would not have been the site that it became. I remember David telling me that Jimmy Miller dug, dug a room a day. That's right. No, I worked it out. He dug, he dug a room. Uh, and it takes us back. We often um, spend nine years digging one house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> next question, please. Yes, you remembered your question. Yeah, yeah, I did. I wanted to ask, how do you identify that those level of houses, stone houses, who are not temples? were not temples. Yeah. So, so, that, so that was Jimmy Mellor's idea, really, that they, they were some sort of special temple-like uh, shrine. He called them yeah. shrines. Yeah. Um, so we're absolutely sure that's not the case, because the, um, the floors in Chagall are made of plaster, very fine plaster, mm -hmm. and they trap lots of evidence of activities. Because they that sometimes mm -hmm. the reason why it takes nine years to dig a chapel is because you can have hundreds of floor layers, and we try to dig them very systematically. And what you find over and all in all the houses is that there's a very dense um, residue of daily activities, mm -hmm. cooking and food production, stone tool, bone production, you know, mm -hmm. you name it. So they, these these are houses that people really lived in. We find lots of smoke on the walls that come from the oven and the hearth. The ovens and the hearths have lots of residues of fats and, and, and cereals and so on. The pots have got lots of residues of fats and cereals. And we, we, can, we can actually look, we can see people taking grain out of the grain bins, taking them out, um, uh, doing a, an initial winnowing and leaving and residues, and then, and then taking them somewhere else and grinding them, and leaving other residues, and then putting them uh, in the oven to make bread and finding residues of bread and so on. So, so we, we have the whole sequence of people doing things in the houses. Mm -hmm. So, so they're, they're all domestic houses, but some of them are more elaborate than others and have more burial and symbolism in them. So with the same method, you could not identify any shrines where there was no, a... That's there, there are no, there are no shrines that are... And that, well, that, the distinctive thing about Chapel Hill is that there's nothing that we found except houses and refuse. Mm -hmm. That there are there are no special buildings of any sort. There's no and, and all the scraping and the jeep ground penetration radar, all the stuff that we've done, we can't find anything else. And it may be there, <coughs> but by my view is that there isn't anything else. It's just houses and rubbish. Well, you said that it was only a residential area, 
Yes, I mean, maybe it's, 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 maybe we're, we're, a trade I, took place, but not necessarily. Maybe what took yeah. place? The trade. Trade. Yes. yes. I mean, I, I, I am. Um, trading center. Maybe for the trading center. Well, Chadwick is not, not a, I mean, it used to be thought that Chadwick had a big role in obsidian exchange, for example, but in fact, the amount of obsidian at Chadwick is very small. And there's no evidence that Chadwick is very central in, in trading. I mean, he was involved in trading, absolutely, but that's not its reason. That's why it's there. So it is a residential um, yeah. complex, uh, but, but you, you, could, you could also say that it's a necropolis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, what, what we found recently is that many of these buildings, and perhaps all of them, I'm not sure, but the long-lasting buildings that go through time, they, all the cases that we've excavated right down to the bottom of them, we found a cemetery underneath them. So, so you, what you can say is you can argue that they're primarily burial places, that, that you, you, know, you put people and you, in the ground and then you build a house on top and you live in the house. But the purpose is, is actually the burial, not, not the living. And that's a bit extreme, but, but it is interesting that you can see it that way if you, if you want to. And there are people who've written recently about that idea of Chattanooga is basically for burial. You, you talked about how the people were left out, the Dwyer basically, the very yeah. Were they wrapped in it any type of shroud or all Yes, yeah. so there's lots of that. So, um, we sometimes find um, very, very good preservation because of the way some houses are intentionally burned, uh, which means that the burials beneath the floor get baked. And, and so the preservation is remarkable. And so you find these bodies absolutely wrapped in skins and cloth of various types, so flax, lin linen. No, not, there's, not, there's no wool yet, but flax and uh, sorry, linen and skins. And, and sometimes very tightly, so you can actually see, you can see the ropes that go around the body and so on. So, so the, the theory at the moment is that people were um, wrapped and, the, the, and then they were dried out. And that it's the wrapping that has sustained the, the body in its anatomical position. You see what I mean? Because if you just left the bodies out yeah. and dry, they'd all fall apart. Yeah. So, so, but they, they haven't fallen apart, they're in an anatomical position. And we couldn't work that out for a long time, but it does seem that that's what's going on, is that they're being wrapped very, very tightly into a sort of bundle. Any DNA work? What? Any DNA work? Well, I, I, so we, we have tried a lot of ancient DNA work. The, the, um, I think actually partly because of this process, the ancient DNA survives really badly, whereas other sites just down the road um, have very good preservation of ancient DNA. So it's quite likely that the lack of preservation of DNA and good preservation is the result of this being left out process. But, um, but whatever, we've been very unsuccessful. So, but there is a new project that's um, been undertaken by various universities in, in Europe to, to re-look at the DNA, and they, they are showing some success, but it's very hard because it's very badly preserved. So how did it disappear then? What happened? Well, and so the question is, did it disappear? You know, the, the um, uh, I, I showed you there are two mounds, and so what, when the east mound was abandoned, the other mound continued on for another 500 years or so. And uh, at that same time, there's a great uh, flowering settlements in the Connie Plain, and lots and lots of settlements emerge. So, so, so it's quite likely that the population of Chattahuyu, you know, just, it was so successful that people started splitting off and forming other communities, and I, and I think what we see that at Chattahuyu, sort of dispersal. Why, why the mound itself was abandoned, I don't know, but certainly we find working there really hard, because it's very high mound and you have to climb up the top of it all the time, and so there's, at some point or other, presumably, becomes difficult to work there. But also the, the social system was changing, everything was changing, so I, I think it was time to move on. I was reading one of your papers earlier that mentioned the possible evidence of you having, first an earlier phase, more a, a wild bull celebrations where the wild bull would be eaten and then later on it would be more a sheep that would be the main consumption or the main feast 
that people would have. So could it, poss would it possible be there is some kind of a link with animals and etc. Even though you don't have the shrines, you may have some kind of a animal cult as you have the ancestor cults, which is usually part of the indigenous societies. Or do you think that is less likely in our case? No, no, I think that's right. I, I'm afraid I couldn't talk about everything in my talk now. And, and I could have done the whole talk, and have done many times, about, about the animal side of things. And um, so it used to be thought that Chattel Hughes uh, saw the domestication of cattle somewhere in the middle of the sequence. The, the new work is arguing that the cattle were never domesticated at Chattel Hughes. They're, they're all wild, but they're becoming increasingly managed. Uh, and one theory is that the reason that they're being managed is because they were important in rituals. So that, that um, we, we find evidence of feasts on the site, by which I mean something larger than just what you do in your house. So some larger grouping of people coming together, eating more meat um, in a big event of some sort. And these feasts are dominated by, by the bones of wild bulls. Uh, and so it's quite possible that you have a sort of ritual system that, that in which wild animals, particularly bulls, are very important. And there are, there are of course, paintings, which if they're real, <laughs> Uh, they, they, do, they also show teasing and baiting or playing with wild animals and, and so on, particularly bulls. So, so I think it's absolutely clear that uh, wild animals played a big part at Chapel Hill. And it may be that a lot of these interactions across the site were in, in, in terms of those, sorts of those sorts of activities. But quite separate from that are sheep. And uh, through the sequence at Chapel Hill, all the sheep are domesticated. And uh, you have a massive rise in sheep density in the middle of the sequence. So they, they became very, very dependent on, on sheep and processing. But the sheep are never seen, the domestic sheep are never seen in any of the symbolism. Even though they dominate the faunal remains, they just don't exist in the art and the symbolism. So, so they're clearly you know, the domestic side. And you have this great emphasis on wild bulls and, and wild boar and um, uh, deer, leopards of course, bears, so the whole, the whole panoply of wild animals. Yeah. And so, as we go a bit further between kind of archaeology theories, what is your position in terms of the, the post-processualism obviously that you started in, with the, the new perspectivism and the ontological turn and try to make sense of these kind of connections with animals and spirits in their own terms instead of our own kind of a modern term, which is difficult for us to get distant from those those ideas that seem so long ago and so different from our own yes, um, modern right. world, isn't yes. it? Yes, no, that's right. And I, I um, I, and I've written a lot about that in terms of what I call entanglement. And again, I didn't talk about that today, but I wrote a lot about those sorts of ideas, which are very much influenced by new materialism in, in various ways. Uh, I, I've done quite a lot of collaboration on this project with, with social anthropologists in various ways. And uh, a number of them have really emphasized the importance of the role of animals in the, in the um, belief system at Chapel Hill. And uh, we, the, there is a very close relationship between um, the burial of people and the wild animal symbolism. Uh, so, for example, you, you might have a platform which is the central burial platform that people have put in over a long time, and it's surrounded by bull's horns that have been set in around it. And so one, one way of thinking about those sorts of arguments is, is that the, the bulls, if you like, are being fed to the dead. And, and so that, that there's an idea that they are, um, that the power of the bull is needed to enliven the house and to animate the house and to animate the ancestors. So to animate the, the ancestral power of the house, you need to feed it or, or provide these sacrifices of wild bulls. And I think it's a very attractive idea and it fits the evidence very well. And very much is about talking about the house as an animate entity that, is, that, that you need to you know, reanimate with, with these powerful wild animals. Which you also have examples in 18th century England, or some, some skulls <laughs> of horses being placed at, at, the, 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 uh, at in the earth of the, of the floor of the house. So, obviously, it's a, no, no comparable, but something yeah, yeah. That, is, that is there in, in yeah. evidence. Now, I haven't heard those sorts of comparisons, but um, 
Um, as I said, the ethnographers, the anthropologists have been working with me, have been using examples, including from the you know, perspectivism type world, um, but mainly from circumpolar regions. Yeah. Um, you mentioned towards the beginning of the lecture, some of the skulls had um, uh, impact damage on them. And do you think that was because of violence or was it maybe caused the way this it was wrapped very strongly, the, the bodies were very sort of roughly treated, shall we say? No, um, no, no. And, and were there any weapons found in the site? So any sign of aggression? For yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that the, the blood force trauma is produced by the wrapping. It has to be some sort of hit that, that made them. And uh, I. Um, uh, so the, the, there are quite a lot of weapons at Chapelview. There's lots of uh, particularly obsidian arrowheads and spear points, I guess you could call them, which are very beautifully and elaborately made. Um, but we, as I said, we've never found any of them in bodies. So we presume they were either you just for status or, or ritual of some sort, or, 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 or the main uh, weapon in terms of hunting. Uh, uh, killing wild, wild animals or animals of various sorts. So, uh, and there are mace heads, things like that, and the, the, there are balls that are used for cooking that some people argue that balls like sort of this size, which I think were used for cooking, but some people argue could have been slingshots that were used to hit, hit uh, knock out people and so on. So there, there are weapons, but as I said before, there's no evidence that they were used in in, in violence against other other humans, the the, the, the banging on the head, the more the more likely interpretation of that uh, that other people have argued is is just falling over. Or you, know, you, you have to come down a ladder to get into the house. So maybe you fell down and landed on your head or something like that. And I, I'm not a specialist in this sort of thing, but the human remains team that works with the project uh, argues that um, there's lots of evidence that. That, that type of uh, uh, accident does not lead to the sorts of, sort of the locations of the trauma, you know, here mainly, <coughs> that, that, that you, you get at Chathuyu. And so um, an alternative is that there was some sort of ritual uh, process whereby um, you had ritual fighting that led to that, that type of practice. Um, can I ask a question about the, uh, how you imagine the, the beginning of Chitadu? And specifically, uh, you've argued in another talk this morning that uh, agglutination came over time, came during the sequence, mm. uh, this agglutinated uh, pattern. But at the same time, in one of your slides, you show uh, that there are uh, radial lines and terraces. Uh, so I'm wondering how, how does that, I mean, can you imagine that? there would be some sort of central organization and this is how you end up with that pattern or, 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 or what are they? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really hard because you know the early layers at Chattahoe are 21 meters <laughs> yeah. at the top. So to get down there is really a nightmare. And every time I've gone down to the bottom, which I've done twice now, uh, uh, I just end up in rubbish. I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, we haven't found the earliest buildings at Chattahoe. And uh, what um, we, we know a little bit about them because in the rubbish we find very beautifully red painted plaster uh, that some people argue is um, is uh, sort of a gypsum. But, but and so there may be wonderful houses right at the bottom, but we haven't <laughs> found them from where we have dug. We can have the hypothesis that the earlier houses are right under the right under the, the highest point in the mound. And um, and so my theory is, but it's completely untestable, and I, you know, just for the sake of saying it, is is that you start off with a relatively small cluster. I mean, so Doug, Doug Baird has excavated a site nearby for Bonjuku. So I imagine something like Bonjuku, which is a sort of a slightly dispersed but clustered settlement, very small, uh, and that um, that as the settlement grows. It just grows organically, but in a way that's very influenced by this neighbor neighborliness business. So that you want to live next 
to the na your neighbor in a particular cluster of some sort. And so that you can imagine that if you do that, you, you, you will tend to get radial lines moving out um, and sort of clusters emerging. And, and if you look at Ashiklahu, which is another site of the site, you see these long lines yeah. through. And, and in fact, recently they've argued that it's, it's a radial type of line sequence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I, 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 um, that's how I imagine it. But, but it's not a plan process, but it's just the, the, the agglomerating. And, but you want to stay close to your to your neighbors, whatever, whatever group you're in. So that produces that. Does that answer the question? I mean, yeah, sure, I mean, sure. I have no evidence for it. No, I, I, I was wondering, what are these radio lines and these terraces? Yes. What, what are they? And yes. I think you answered this because you, you argued that they're growing out of the place, and that's yes. how you end up with uh, these lines as well. Yeah, what, what's really fascinating is that, so what we see is something later on, where we can see the radial lines. And what's interesting is that uh, one line has got a lot of houses, and then the next line is just rubbish, mm. and then the next line is a lot of houses. So, so at one point, mm -hmm. it was they were really trying to control things mm -hmm. by having access and rubbish and so on along these lines, mm -hmm. but but it very quickly it starts getting filled in, and uh, and you and you end up with that very agglomerated overall. Uh, yeah. Could you say something a little more about the intriguing wall paintings that you showed us? Are they sort of typical of the area, or no, no are they it. specific, or yeah. is there any understanding about meaning? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can imagine, there's a huge literature on that, and I have several students working on that. And I mean, it's a very um, complex uh, area. Um, so. One of, the, one of the fascinating things is that they're not found elsewhere. I mean, there are other sites with various forms of painting um, at the same time or earlier, and there's sort of wonderful engraved, engraved stones at an earlier period. But, but to have this number of paintings, so just in my project, we've excavated 300 paintings. And so they're, they're very, quite common. Uh, and they're just very wonderful. I mean, the, there was just that chapel here, this sort of, um, um, focus on painting. So the question is, what was it doing? Rather like wild animals, what what was the role that it was playing? And so a lot of people have tried to make sense of them. One, one very important thing to recognise is that as well as these many layers of plaster on the floor, there were there are often hundreds of layers of plaster. So they they were replastering the walls maybe two or three times a year, just to sort of whiten them and to clean them up. And so. It, what one of my students is doing is looking through these sequences. You can have four or five hundred layers of, paint, of wall plaster, and you can look at where the paintings occur in that. And, and it's very um, patterned. It's, it's not the case that they just randomly through the sequence. You get white, 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 and then a whole series of paintings, and then white, 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 white. And then if you try to link the paintings to what's going on in the house at that time, there, there's, a, there's a very strong relationship with burial. So, and there's a, that's also spatial, so that you know, the, the platform that has the most burial, the main burials, is also the one where the paintings are, are found. So in some way or other, he's going back to the thing, is there some agency of the, of the painting that, that allows one to communicate to the dead or to protect the dead or to have the dead speak in some way? What, what is that relationship? So I think it's wrong to see it as art. And, and better to see it as some sort of um, uh, active involvement in, in society that these paintings are supposed to just be occurring. I mean, that, that's what I'm mainly talking about there is um, geometric paintings. So they're, they're in the later levels of the site, when things start changing quite dramatically, um, there are these wonderful scenes of teasing and baiting wild animals. Um, and these um, these are not replaced frequently. They, they, they seem to be more stable. And so towards the end of Chapel Hill, everything starts changing. So what I said is really about that middle phase that I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the possibilities of uh, adoption as uh, the people buried together are not genetically related. Uh, could it have been a factor that controlled uh, interpersonal violence? Yes, I think so. Um, 
Or if my own family's got anything to <laughs> say about it. Now, I'm not sure that families are <laughs> lacking in potential for violence. But anyway, I, I um, but, it, but it certainly is intriguing, isn't it? I mean, wh why would you do this? <clears throat> and and, and, the, and the, the sense that it, it may lead to a situation where you don't really know who, who is related to you or not. Uh, and if you, have, if you have some notion that you act altruistically to those people who are close to you, one, one can sort of see how it might, you know, might really work. So I, I don't, I mean, it's difficult to know, but, but, I, but it does seem that by farming children out in that way, you, you, you create much closer connections and you prevent, in particular, you prevent that sort of relationship between resources and, and the nuclear family which, which is so dangerous in, in societies. You know, that one, once the family identifies itself as a biological distinct entity and it controls its own resources, it has ownership, you know, then, then you begin to get the real potential for fragmentation. But if you, if you have a sense in which you, 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 you're not allowing ownership, as I was saying, there's no evidence that particular groups control resources in any, in any particular way. So there's much as a, and I see Chadwick is very much emphasizing sharing. So, so if you're emphasizing sharing and, and, and preventing ownership, um, that seems to be a key thing to stopping violence emerging. Is there any parallel example uh, for societies uh, which were working uh, like this? Do you mean in the... In the, in the uh, like history, the anthropological... Uh, anthropological uh, yes, yes, yes there are, absolutely, yes. There, there are many societies, there are quite a lot of societies that do this farming out, adopting type, mm -hmm. type thing, yeah. So it is quite evident uh, because of, of this, because we see parallel examples that they were actually uh, lived in the same household, it wasn't just uh, placed there after death. Yeah, no, so, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, the brick work on those problems is quite stri striking. Mm -hmm. Have you found any evidence of brick work looking like structure or anything? Where could they have got that idea from? Yeah, so all the houses are made of mud bricks, so they're, they're sort of quite long um, brick-like shapes. And, and, and they were laid, laid in exactly that sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, we call it a brick pattern, but there's you know, I'm not saying those are bricks. I, we just it's, they're, they're in the shape of bricks, yeah. but we I, I wouldn't want to say they actually were bricks. But there were structures. But like there, that but there were structures use. that had bricks like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have I have one question. Uh, from Botrucu, we have uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, about whether the site is really Neolithic uh, because you have evidence for domestic plants but no domestic animals. And I'm wondering, Ashetaliuk, would you say that the, that the site is Neolithic uh, because there is evidence of food production, but do we know about the subsistence? Are they, you know, is that, did they get most of their subsistence from these domestic species or did they also do a lot of hunting because you said now that uh, cattle are not domesticated, for instance. So what, what is your view on this? Uh, no. I mean, Chaplok is a very agricultural okay. society. I mean, I, I didn't talk about um, uh, all, all the huge amount of evidence that's been done on the archaeobotanical stuff by Amy Bogard and by Charles and her team and so on. But uh, um, the, 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 this is an intensive and very effective uh, farming in which there is also manuring <coughs> and um, integration of animals, uh, sheep, into, into an agricultural system. Um, but they are also, you know, I mean, it's still, you know, non-Neolithic in, in the sense that um, uh, the, there's uh, quite a lot of wild plants and <coughs> quite a lot of emphasis on on wild animals, but the proportion is, you know, the overall proportion, I, I can't remember what the numbers are, I'm afraid, but, but the, the percentage of wild animal bones is less than 10%.
but it's a small, smaller number. Yeah. So I, I mean, what you call Neolithic is, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. very, very difficult, and uh, and I wouldn't want to get involved in trying to say. I, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're sitting upon Duke talking about whether it's Neolithic or not. <laughs> it seems to me, you no, know, that's nice. a classic yeah. catering thing that I don't think is terribly helpful. But but I but I but I take it what you mean that there's a there's a very strong emphasis on. Um, Wild animals and plants are fungi. Sorry. Um, is there any chance that Chesapeake could be um, a sort of suburbs to a larger city, where the central is Um No, no. That that type of system doesn't really exist at this sort of period. And uh, we have, as I said, I think earlier that there are quite a number of surveys that have been done of the total landscape of, of the Collier Plain, and. Um, if there was a larger chapter league somewhere, someone would have found it by right now. So serial use over time, how does that Sorry? Work? How does serial use over time work out? Is there, is, is there a clear trajectory? There's a lot of change. I mean, one of the things that is very distinctive now about Chattel which is different from what Jimmy found, was that um, there's a lot, a lot of change going on, and agric agricultural change in terms of the crops and so on. So, for example, there's this new type of wheat that's very imaginatively called the new type <laughs> that, that, that um, has now been discovered, uh, and um, that comes in. So that comes in. So it doesn't exist anymore. It's a type of wheat that came in and disappeared. Um, that that um, uh, comes in massively in the middle of the sequence, for example. And then there's you know, um, new forms of wheat that emerge towards the end of the sequence. There's lots and lots of change going on all the time. There's so many parallels with contemporary contemporary anatomy and relationship systems life. <laughs> I know that it's very dangerous, but yeah, it's very dangerous. It's really good. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm stopping someone else's question. Oh, you mentioned a, a kind of burial which contains a separate skull and a Skeleton. What do you think of this uh, phenomenon, or could it be considered as a um, uh, phenomenon which reflect uh, family relationship or other kind of uh, customs? Yeah. We, um, you're talking about the skull that was found in the grave <coughs> with, with another woman. Yeah. Yeah. Is it common in this site, or is um, um, very few examples of this kind. Of thing. I, I mean, we, we found about, as I said, eight, around 800 bodies, and I think there are 15, about 15 skulls like that, and I think there are about 15 bodies that clearly had their heads taken off. So it's a small number, really, in relation to the total number, and it's very, very difficult. But it's very difficult not to impose our own assumptions on that. You know, it's very difficult not to say, oh, these are, this is a love relationship when you're looking to the face of another skull. And you, so you can imagine, you, know, you can ma imagine somebody who, who's, whose mother or something had died a long time earlier, and when she died, she had a, and so on. So you can imagine all that sort of thing. But it's very, very dangerous to do that. And we, we don't really have any evidence that will allow us to say very much more about why that happened. But it's clearly the case uh, the skulls, the mool of skulls is very important. So for example, we find skulls placed at the bottom of posts that hold up the house. So you have a post at the bottom, they place a, a human skull. So that, that suggests that you've got the ancestors holding up the house in some way or other. And I think all one can really say is that ancestors were very important and that, and that they played an active role in, in the present, that they were kept and uh, remain part of the society in some way or other. Uh, but exactly what that relationship is, we don't know. We, we are trying to look at the diet of all the skulls and look at the ancient DNA of all the skulls and, the t and so on and so forth mm -hmm. to see whether there's anything distinctive about them. But at the moment, we haven't come up with any pattern. I'm, I'm curious if there's any indication of what the, what the impetus was to demolish one building and then rebuild one on the same yes. spot. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, it, it, the, um, 
part of the answer might be just uh, space, and, and, and uh, these are relatively small houses. And um, once you've dug holes for 60 people to be buried in them, it's sort of, you know, you're getting a bit cramped. And, and also they're building up the floor and pulling in the walls, and, you know, so space is getting more restricted, they get more difficult to sort of move around in. And so part of it's that. But, but we don't have any real evidence that that's the problem. Um, we have a lot of evidence of walls slumping and falling and so on. So there could be that things become unstable in this mound. And if you imagine this huge mound, the pressure, you know, is enormous. And we find all the houses leaning out around this thing. So there's lots of problems. But again, we don't have any real evidence that that's what's causing. The only real evidence we have is much more related to this burial issue that we found recently a number of cases where the last thing that happened was that someone was buried, and that the, the, the floor was never replastered. Uh, and so it's possible that you have some sort of cycle of, or biography of a house where you have uh, people that live in it, and that they come to the end of a cycle of some sort, and then when the last person, or an important person, or whatever, we don't really know, but something happens, and then uh, the house is abandoned and rebuilt, and you, yeah. Is it common, you mentioned deliberate fires, deliberate yeah. burning of buildings. Was that a common activity? I imagine that would be hard to control in such a compact and complex series of, of yeah, structures. Right. So, so the, the, bur the, the burning is something that doesn't happen through most of the sequence. But there's just this one time period, the same time period of 6500, where all the burning occurs. And it seems to be very controlled, um, very managed. It's not a general conflagration. Each, each house is burnt separately and, and is fired. It's not just burned, but it's actually like add fuel in and, and fire it. And before they fire it, they go through a very elaborate rituals of various sorts, particularly smashing up querns or smashing up pottery and putting things in the house and, and removing things from the house, you know, taking away the bull's horns and leopard things, you know, taking stuff out, adding other things in. So the long process of doing stuff and then burning it uh, and then building another house on top. So, yeah, it's something to do with ending ending a house. But, but why it happens at a particular time period and not at other periods, I, we don't know yet. Do we have any idea who these people were? Were they in the Europeans, for example? Um, well, as I said, we don't, we don't have um, ancient DNA that's been very effective yet, so we can't answer how it fits into the general pattern, which has now been very well established of movements of people from uh, the Middle East through Anatolia and into, um, into Europe. The site at Bonjuklu, uh, they, well, they have been more successful, and it does seem that those sorts of um, those individuals were ancestral to, or related to, the groups that moved into Europe. And, uh, and some people argue that what we see at Chapelhuyu is this sort of build up a population, and then I, I sort of said that at the upper levels of this dispersal. So one idea is that the sort of tensions that built up at Chapelhuyu were part of a lar lar larger regional process of build up of tensions that were, were resolved by people then splitting off, going into northwest Anatolia and, and into ultimately into Europe. But um, so that's so it's probably the case that they're part of that uh, movement um, or contributing to it in some way. But we don't have we can't say at the moment we don't have the ancient DNA on them. Yeah. Um, I'm I think that um, Professor Hobbit has obviously come a long way in the long days, so I think probably we should just say how very grateful we are. Thank you very much.